have gone to the Home Office and said, we have been arguing with you, and if you don't listen to me, my generation, the next generation is going to come at you with knives. This is the evolutionary story of the birth of British punk. The underground London scene that came before the fabled ground zero of the Sex Pistols' anarchy in the UK. Over time, punk has been mythologized and reduced to a barrage of swearing, spitting, and... Well, it's nearing the end of the season anyway. Hey, Barry, can you drop a response for me and get a travel card? My hands are too small. The story will continue after this. Casuals are a subculture of a subculture, spawning out a football hooliganism while giving it a distinct flair of fashionable dress. For while our hooligan friends would wear a jersey or hoodie, these casuals, ironic to their name, would dress fashionably in name brand clothing like Fila, LS, Kappa, even Burberry. Anything that was a high value European brand with sportswear was their wardrobe. Kind of an odd choice to dress up to go to a sporting game, seeing as what they wore was inspired partly by punks, mods, and Northern Soul. But who am I to judge? I just change hats and nothing else every episode. Like anything regarding odd fashion choices, we'll have to look at the decade that spawned the trend of neon and hairspray. That's right, the 1980s. In Liverpool more specifically, but in a few other rings of hooligan culture too. Here we would see young men, some part of hooligan firms, begin to dress much nicer than their contemporaries and rival firms. Liverpool FC was considered one of the first football clubs to have hooligan groups who did this. With stories dating back to the late 70s of fans storming into designer stores during the European Cup, slicing brands off of clothing to sew onto their own, and lifting brand name items from sportswear stores on the continent out of the carnal urge to dress like the mainland Europeans did. So these lads from Liverpool helped launch a reverse British invasion, and introduced once unknown sportswear brands to the UK. And hooligans everywhere, from Chelsea to Aberdeen, ate it up. So throughout the 80s, one could see groups of youths walking around dressed ready for the tennis courts, but in all actuality, going to the Rangers game ready to kick in some Celtic FC heads. A better way for me to describe this would be, think of Patrick Bateman in terms of style, but instead of an American psycho, he's an Anfield Yabo. Casual groups appeared all over the north of England and in parts of Scotland. One great source for this video is Dan Rose's Congratulations, You've Just Met the Casuals, which details the writer's time as part of the Aberdeen scene of the subculture. Firms like Rose's would have a heyday throughout the decade, filled with a lot of violence, chanting, and even good old-fashioned dress-up. But much like the economic cocaine high of the 80s, the casual scene would hit a pitfall, or rather, a Britfall, if you will. After the disasters at Highsill and Hillsborough, hooligan culture would be changed. And as such, the casuals would be hit as well. The police caught on to such hooligan actions. And with the same practices and equipment used to stamp down on the English hooligan firms in the stadium, casuals would be pushed out onto the streets. This didn't affect the casuals much. They weren't that violent to begin with. The true issue of the fall of the 80s casual was culturally. Youth trends of the times changed towards dance and acid house scenes, with many casuals becoming part of rave culture. It would seem that through it all, casuals would be as short-lived as English World Cup dreams. But casual culture held on. While the house scene happened during the late 80s to early 90s, popular music would help reignite the casuals. Britpop, short for British pop, was a music genre that combined punk, glam, and indie pop with a quintessentially British feel to it. It should be noted that this genre came out during a cultural period known as Cool Britannia, where a renewed optimism in the British economy and culture led to an echo of the 60s in music. This is where groups like Oasis, Blur, Pulp, Super Furry Animals, and all these artists made airtime and the charts. With this renewed love of all things British, England would host the Euro 96 football tournament. And aside from the fun times in Trafalgar Square after a loss to Germany, <laughs> football culture remained better off than during those incidents in the 80s, and the same could be said for the casuals. The 90s casual evolved from the hooligan firms that made up the last decade into more of a lad culture, with the beginnings of a more fashion-oriented sport culture we see today popping up in firms the nation over. And as we get into the 2000s, the casual would continue that way. Aside from some youths here and there who saw the subculture as more of a fighting man's thing, the subculture at large was more fashion-oriented and a bit more laddie. But why are these kids wanting to fight fellow nicely dressed casuals? Well, thanks to several films released over the past three decades, a renewed interest in hooliganism overtook the zeitgeist. Luckily, 2000s casuals were still a lad culture through and through, rather enjoying the fashion of terraces than the blood that could be spilt on them. But are casuals still around to this day? Yeah, and nothing much has changed aside from them getting smartphones and being stung by the same regulations that hurt hooligans. But those regulations have led the casuals away from their violent roots that came about in the 80s. 
instead being more of a fashion subculture for working class young men. Other than that, there really hasn't been much change since the 90s, with many youths still singing Britpop, wearing their Star Island or Lacoste, and trying to show up the other guys with flashier brands. Compared to the other groups from the Hooligans video, the casuals are near the middle on the violent scale. While originally a smartly dressed hooligan subculture, they have evolved into their own thing and tried to step away from the blood sport that comes with being in the audience. This has allowed them to slip away from police profiling for hooligan groups and do their own thing. Casually, of course. Wait, do we even know where the term casual comes from? The greatest idea of where it comes from is that they have a more casual form of dress compared to hooligans. All that nice outerwear that separates them from the riffraff in jerseys and wife beaters on game day. A lot of these groups would even differentiate themselves by putting casuals in the name just so they were not known as hooligans. But why do we have to differentiate casuals from those others? Why do they do something different? One could even say, why they do that? What's more intimidating? A group of men wearing jerseys of the enemy team, all standing in one section of the stadium that security can get a handle on if they're not rowdy enough? Or men hiding amongst your own ranks, wearing nice shirts and trainers, ready to strike the moment your team does something they don't like? If you chose the latter, you're thinking like a casual. Compared to regular hooligans and ultras, the casual was more of a stealth build. The whole point of their outfits were to differentiate themselves from the common football fan and not get profiled as hooligans while going into stadiums. Some, like that lovely hypothetical, would even sneak into the rows of the other team's fans to sow chaos when possible. But that was more the 80s casual. The 90s onward focused on something different. Now, we can't really talk about casual culture without continuing to say something about the fashion. Casuals saw the terrace of any football stadium as a catwalk, so here you would see sharply dressed youths among the striped jerseys and plain colors. Something like that minion suit meme trend thing from 2022, but with sportswear. Greatly influenced by mods and skinheads and apparel, and while stepping more into a postmodern look in the last two decades, the fashion still holds greatly to this day. Many youths will join up with casual outfits because of this love for nice sportswear, but they stay for another reason. Camaraderie was another draw to the casuals. Much like hooligan outfits, which the casuals wear most times, there was a strong sense of community. Whether you were 50 or 500 strong, this was the ASC. These were your boys, the ones who would watch your back no matter what. At the car, there was a nucleus of precise organization. For the most part, anyway. The sense of belonging among these casuals is a strong one. So much so that even close to four decades later, you might hear old men from rival firms talking about the good old days of football. That's right, this camaraderie goes beyond many's own firms. This casual for the fun of it was the lad culture aspect of the casual. While you had your hooligan firms going about and destroying anything not related to their team, the casuals would rather dress nicely, go see a game, and maybe have a polite yell at the other firm, with a few punches here and there depending on the decade. Because after all, like our friendly hooligans, the casuals are a subculture mired in violence. In fact, like I said earlier in the video, this subculture is a sub-subculture of football hooliganism. So to save me some time from writing this, and to make my editor hate me, we're just going to throw in the applicable part from our hooligans video. Other than that, casuals don't really have much in criticism aside from the hooligan things. While we could say something about the culture itself being more superficial, it wouldn't be worth the effort, especially after so many episodes where we squeezed out more specific things from broader topics. So we'll just draw the line there, and leave a written note if anything else does come up wrong with the subculture. Now that's what I call a sub-subculture, taking cues from the hooligan subculture, but also sharing the high fashion choices of the more well-off ones. These working class lads from Aberdeen to London set a staple for dressing well and hitting hard giving a movement within hooliganism its own name. And while they don't hit as hard physically anymore, they can still be seen in their sometimes stealthy, sometimes flashy outfits whenever the next time their team plays. The casuals, everyone. Everything but casual in name. There we go, the last episode of Season 1. A nice, shortish episode to tie a bow off on this channel's gift to the interwebs. I didn't think we'd get this far when we started writing this in some lower Saxon cafe back in January of 22. Since we're at the end for the first season, the staff and I here thought it would be a fun idea to show you the set list for Season 2 and get your hopes up. So here it is. Yeah, it's all censored. I said we shouldn't ruin the surprise, but they let me say that we do have bikers coming up. With that, we'll see you in Season 2. Do I need to do a cool take here, or what do I need to do exactly? Both? Okay. I'm Mick Cooley, and you're watching Subculture Shock. That sound alright? From all of us here on the OF team, I just want to say... Oh hey, the game's over. Oh no, the game's over.